Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight. And welcome. Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you for logging on. Happy Friday and welcome back to another edition of The Trading Desk on Watchbox Studios. My name, Joshua Thanos. This is my life partner, Jason Maine. Not all chrono cloning originates from the same stem cells. Here with four dead ringers that explain how mirror machines happen in the watch world. First scenario, the costly watch that inspires a more affordable watch. Everyone knows this green machine. Since 2010, Rolex has offered its latest take on the green sub, and for $9,050 US in about 18 months of waiting, you two can strap on the hottest submariner of our moment. And both of those obstacles, wait list and price, no doubt inspired Oris to offer this loosely veiled tribute piece at Basel World 2018. Now this is important because this is not a ripoff and Rolex should not take umbrage. Oris can get away with this because first and foremost, the Aquastate green ceramic costs $2,000 on a bracelet. It costs $2,000. And apart from the bezel and the dial, big parts admittedly, the green Aquas is a very different kind of offering. The leather strap, for example, offers a look for which Rolex dive watches have no factory alternative. And there's a rubber strap for good measure and perhaps a lower price of admission. Plus, the Aquastate is 43.5 millimeters and physically shares few common shapes with the Rolex of case or dial. And the Rolex as a whole is far richer in detail. You hold them in the hand, there's no confusing the two, especially when you behold that green gold dial, and that is Rolex's term for it. Worth the price of admission, worth the premium, but again, because this is four and a half times the price of the Oris, there's really no conflict here. Rather than pirating Hulk sales from Rolex, Oris is offering an entry point for those who aspire to Rolex, doing so with a product of great integrity and honesty. Rolex Hulk owners might even buy the Oris as a daily driver for those times when you can't risk sending the sub to the watch body shop. Rather than a rival, the Oris and price point lookalikes in this vein can be considered both a compliment in the pairing sense and a compliment in the flattering sense to the Rolex Submariner Hulk. But make no mistake, if actual segment and price point rivals to Rolex and you know which brands they are, you know their names, did something this overt, there would be consequences. Two minutes to midnight, baby. Okay, now, if three of a kind beats a pair, and Richemont is all about this sort of thing, the same watch at different price points, check out this trio of world timers from Mont Blanc, Chegere Le Coult, and Vacheron Constantin. Again, no conflict because of price point, but Richemont does love it, some family resemblance. Scenario two, declaring open watch fair on arrival within the watch space. Does that remind you of anything? That was 2018 at Gerard Perregaux. So while Oris was getting in touch with its inner Hulk before Basel 2018, Gerard Perregaux was revving up to deliver the 2018 Laureato Chronograph Collection at Geneva's SIHH in January. Can we go full screen on that, guys? Get a load of these, because you're going to see something awfully reminiscent in just a moment. I was with the press corps, and most agreed that in isolation, the new GP Chrono looked, felt, and was equal to its price. The only complication, and I don't mean watchmaking, was the 2017 Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chronograph Collection. Do they look familiar? Here's how it goes down. It only takes one quick glance back at the 2018 Laureato chronograph, and there is a distinct case of deja vu. We were in Geneva, after all, at SIHH. It's one matter and circumstance for a value brand like Oris to crib a few color keys from a Rolex that costs almost five times as much. But the price gap between this guy and this guy isn't quite as broad. Yes, the AP is a $24,300 watch, and yes, the Girard Perigot costs $15,000 US, but that creates the appearance that GP intends to siphon some sales with a comparable product at a value play alternative price point. They're uncomfortably close in both style and price, and unlike Rolex and Oris, 
in terms of peer quality, AP and GP are much closer to being volume and marketplace equivalents. GP's new chronograph even bears an uncanny resemblance to the latest Royal Oak Chrono down to the individual models. The first one was the GP, the second is the Royal Oak Chrono. So why doesn't this lead to blows? Let's cut straight to the chase. Well, for one thing, it's not new. The 1972 Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 5402 almost immediately encountered a challenge from the 1975 GP Laureato. That was the 4266 TA. And frankly, back then, no legal legacy was established to prevent design in kind. Um, here we have, um, you know, I'm sure you guys will all recognize it. This is a Patek Philippe 5980 two-tone. So that is an AR, meaning it is steel and rose gold. So this is similar to the all rose gold, the only two um, 5980 still in production. Um, they've obviously discontinued the all steel version. Here we have the steel and rose gold with a bright blue dial, rose indices. You've got the rose bezel, and then you've got the you know the steel bracelet with the the rose center links. And to me, this watch I think didn't get nearly enough credit when it was being um, I would say when it was being produced in conjunction with all three. Um, you know. Consumers tended to gravitate more towards either the all rose or the steel, but you know I think it's absolutely beautiful, um, and you know I think that it's definitely, you know it's got a pop on the wrist while still less a so call it less blingy than the all rose version. A couple of things I like about this watch. First, it was a low lying debut in 2013. As you said, the watch didn't get enough press when it was released. Mm -hmm. 2013 was a big year just across the board for a lot of brands. And this one, as a variation of an existing model, sort of got lost in the shuffle. But it has a few qualities that really stand out. First, less is more. Less gold is more dramatic. A full gold 5980 is overpowering. But the red highlights here, especially next to that iridescent blue metallic dial, simply explode. I'll also say this. Like Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe has several different dials for its core sports watches. They have darker and lighter blues, and this is one of the lighter ones. AP has a lighter blue for its yellow gold Royal Oaks, and Patek had a lighter blue for its rose gold and steel Nautilus Chrono. And it is dramatic seeing that explosive metallic blue right next to the red gold. The way the red gold frames the blue is simply its virtuosity in design, and that's maybe not something the Nautilus Chrono gets enough credit for, just how well integrated all the elements are. It's a, You'd think it's a huge watch, you'd think it's the size of an offshore, but then you look at it on the wrist, and it's relatively slim, it's only 12.5 millimeters thick, that's about a Daytona. It wears on my tiny wrist, and yet it gives you everything you want. Automatic winding, flyback chrono, 120 meters water resistant, they even prevent it from looking like an elephant-eared adaptation of a chrono to a standard watch by integrating those chrono pushers into the frame on the crown side of the timepiece. It's a remarkably good adaptation of a watch designed decades ago, never intended to be a chronograph, and they did it with color and panache. Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely, um, I think it's an absolutely awesome combination. And, you know, as we both said, I don't think it got enough, you know, it's still being produced, but it, you know, obviously all Nautiluses now are extremely difficult to come by, but this one more than most. I mean, I, we've probably seen um, less of this watch than almost any other Nautilus currently in production. That's a fact. I think I've had one previous opportunity to film this watch, and that watch and this watch, that's the extent of what I've seen in four and a half years doing this. Now you can see two different takes on a Patek Philippe, mostly steel flyback chrono. We just showed you the 5981AR, so I'm going to show you the 5960-1A and I believe this is the 010. This is a model that bowed in early 2017 and was discontinued in late 2017, which is to say it's pretty much a perfect storm. A steel Patek Philippe sports watch produced for about nine months. Add to the fact that there was also a white dial variant, and you realize just how subdivided Patek steel sports watch production is. So 20% of Patek production is steel. Most of that is the ladies 24. Most of the remainder is Aquanauts and Nautilus. Of these, the 5961A, most were made from 2014 to 2018 as the white dial, and a small subset of production for one year was this black dial. That's a rare watch, and a fun one to own. Yeah, I mean, I love this watch, and I think that you know, the 5960 in general was definitely one of those references that paddock collectors either really, really loved or really, really disliked. And I think a lot of that came down 
partially to the bracelet. I think that some collectors or consumers were put off by the high polish. Um, and perhaps just the sporty nature of that, you know, the original iteration being the white, sort of that stark white dial, the sporty nature of the watch in a watch that sort of was in between being a sport or dress watch. I understand there's some level that you want to make sure that the person you're talking to is is not feeding you BS or bullshit, right? So that goes to my next next step. And really, it's actually your first step is be, if you want to negotiate, right? So again, this is what the, our conversation is about, you know, making sure that you're getting, when you're talking about a pre-owned watch, getting a good price because it is speculative. First thing, number one, is do your research. Like, don't just walk in blind. So, you know, I, I remember a, a buddy of mine, his dad told me that he goes in, when he buys jewelry, he goes and looks at the sticker price and offers 25% because he was told that that's what he should do. It's like, well, but I that's mean, just that's a completely yeah. uneducated way to doing anything. So imagine, so I have some customers uh, uh, that are you know own restaurants, right? So imagine I walked in and said, hey, you know what? I don't want to pay your your the price on the on the on the um, on the menu. I'm going to offer you half. You just the people look at you like, what are you are you stupid, right? It's an uneducated way of doing things. So do your research if this is what you want to do. Okay. If you want to get a better price than what's listed, you can ask. Hey, is there is there some is there? Yeah, it never hurts to ask. I mean, right. and but if you don't if you don't know what you're asking for, well, then how are you going to know you're going to get a good deal? So do your research, and there's a lot of different ways to do that too. Right. right. You can go to eBay and look for sold listings. Okay. You can see what people are asking for watches too. That doesn't always show you the true market, but it certainly should tell you something. You know, if if you're looking at a Seamaster, asking price is probably you know are going to be more relevant than if you're looking at you know, some obscure Panerai or something like that, right? Or, yeah, so, or this, uh, the center, the this, central Turbion this Omega. crazy watch that I've, that's ridiculous in every single way, but I've now come to love um, the yellow brick road, well, that as watch, I call it. Yeah, no, that watch listed online, if you show them a, uh, a, a screenshot. So this is an Omega DeVille central Turbion, a roughly $100,000 retail price. So we have this listed on our website for forty nine nine fifty, right? So f for $50,000, we have that listed. All right. So say you decide you like that watch mm -hmm. and you want to buy it pre-owned because you don't want to pay full list for it. And you look online and you see this watch listed anywhere. I, I think ours is probably the lowest price listed online because there's not many of these pre-owned anyways. But you see them listed online from anywhere between fifty thousand and a hundred thousand. So between you know uh, a legitimate pre-owned dealer's price and list price. How do you know what a good price is? How do you know that fifty thousand dollars is a good price? That's going to be tougher. On a watch so, like that, anyway. I can tell you what I would want to do. Is sure. What I would want to do is have a guy mm -hmm. that I trust, that I could go to, and he's in my cell phone already, and I've talked about a bunch of watches with him before, mm -hmm. and ask him his opinion. If that, if this watch is not available from us, and it was available from a competitor, half of my really good clients would say, hey, listen, I know it's not your watch, but what do you think? Yeah. And I have no problem doing that. I, I tell guys all the time, what is if it you're worth? in if a boutique, call me. You know, like if you have a question that a salesperson at a boutique can't answer, call me. Mm -hmm. I'll try and help you out. The thing is, is that having that relationship, which is what we were talking about, is very important. Here's something that Joe, John Doe and I both agree on. The, cent the center turbion or the central turbion is boss. I agree. He just said that's what he, he, mm. he gave that watch a comment. I mean, I don't know if I'd ever buy it. It's it's both hideous and amazing at the same time. It's horrible in the the best, best way. fantastic way possible yeah, it's exactly amazing. i love that watch that's not a, that's if you're a high volume trader though that is not a watch Here's two watches that have never sat next to each other again <laughs> and never will again so but again like you want to so somebody on there said that um you just just check chrono 24 so again that's not there's no end all be all right. even for us so if we do this for a living we're high volume right i buy 50 to 100 watches a month you're buying 30 30 to 60 watches every month sure um uh you know and we're buying those for our company for resale. So we have to figure out, number one, what is it going to sell for? How long is it going to take to sell? And how much can we buy it for that, that you know, it's not too low because we are not we don't want to steal or, or offend our customers. Right. But also, it's not so high that we won't be able to make a profit for the company and keep the ball rolling so we can have money to buy other watches and sure. you know, fill our stock. So, again, it's, you know, how do you determine that? Well, we look at, for us, we're lucky because we, as being a high-volume dealer, I can look at, all the data. We know exactly what the watch sold for, and that is the most important data. If you can find a confirmed sale, then that is probably one of the most, that's the best way to figure out what the watch is actually worth. Yeah.